Okay. Um, also, you worked at Transmeta, okay? So you've worked with yeah. two of the greatest programmers that ever lived, right? That's Judd true. Carmack and Linus Torvalds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they seem like completely radically different personalities. They sure as <laughs> fuck are. Well, yeah. What was it like working with Linus? Um, Linus is very like, um, he's very stubborn and he's very um, uh, opinionated and funny and, uh, and fucking brilliant. Um, and, uh, uh, and, he's, and he's, just, he's a treat to chat with. If you like that kind of uh, Finnish kind of dark humor, but if you're on a mailing list, you can take it wrong and think that he's being an asshole. But he's really he's actually trying to like connect with you, right? Uh, by talking talking shit. Anyway, I think he's uh, lovely, but I didn't work with him personally mm -hmm. very much. Um, there was a whole team of like fucking brilliant MIT and Stanford PhDs that were specifically in the space of this code translation technology. And uh, I worked with several of those guys and they all went on to do just amazing, amazing shit. Um, one of them ended up one of the lead dudes at NVIDIA, another one ended up in Intel and they all scattered to the wind after that. But um, I just thought it was fascinating and I thought it was such a great challenge because they they basically, uh, you know, in getting hired, their problem was that they had this one game, you know, they're, they're translating x86, this machine code, from that to a completely different machine language without the benefit of the source code. And they have to make it really fast, as faster, faster. And, and it was all working perfectly, but on one game, I think it was Formula One or something, there was one corner of one triangle that was a post process of the entire screen that was darker than the other corners than it shouldn't be. So they had a floating point bug in this one case and they couldn't find it in any other of their tests, right? They're like, how do we track this down? We don't even know where to begin. We don't have the source code of this shit. Like how the fuck do you find like one corner of a triangle? And, you know, I'm a game developer. I'm like, yeah, well, you just suffer. <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah, yeah. this is how we do it. Yeah. We just suffer and then we find it. And so uh, uh, so I, that, that's kind of how I got in there. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of weird. It's like that code morphing technology was... I just kind of feel like it was a good idea, but then I guess maybe nobody realized that processors would just become so powerful so quickly that it wasn't necessarily needed. Like, I mean, the, the mobile revolution hadn't really happened yet, so low power chips that were fast weren't really a thing yet. Yeah, I mean, so we were competing with the Pentium 4, yeah. which was the hottest and mm -hmm. the least efficient of all of Intel's processors. And so we looked really good compared to them, uh, but the, you know, the bar was set low. But our problem wasn't, the code morphing technology, it was fucking amazing, uh, frankly. And it's still in heavy use in all kinds of places today, uh, just different applications. Um, you know, Apple did something similar with, I think they called it Rosetta or right. something like that. And maybe Proton, would you consider a Proton? Yeah. Similar, yeah. Exactly, and and the, the crazy thing that you learn doing this is that if you take a statically compiled code, you decompile it and instrument it at runtime and then recompile it, it will be faster than the original statically compiled code if you do this mm -hmm. properly. Uh, and that just blew my mind that nobody teaches this in, in computer science degrees. And, uh, but it was proved by HP's Dynamo project, you know, decades and decades ago. Anyway, uh, but yeah, our problem was that we kept fucking up on the hardware side. So we kept doing tape outs with, with hardware bugs and you just can't have hardware bugs. Yeah. And, and, you know, come on, it's a really, really hard problem. But I think the odds of getting a single company, which is both really good at hardware and really good at software, I mean, you know how rarely that happens. Yeah. Uh, so I think that was, you know, the odds were against us. Yeah. Um, what, and, what, oh. And we, we had kind of that dumbass management, like oh, a you did? crack where, oh. where we were like, oh, let's do that too. Let's, let's do that too. Uh -huh. You know, we, we would do a bit of that too.
Well, you're trying. That was your attempt to go go Silicon Valley big time, right? I mean, that was like you wanted to go public. You wanted to do the whole yeah, we thing. Did. We, we did. We did public. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems it was, like it was like, very successful for the investors. Yeah. Right. I mean, but yeah. it seems like you made most of the money from the Intel lawsuit than actual revenue from the company. No, no, it was from the IPO. So, like, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, the IPO. We had a first week market valuation of five billion, uh, and the the invest it was on off of an investment of I think under one hundred and fifty million. Oh. So that's a great return. That's sweet. Yeah. Okay, as long as you can get out in time. Yeah, well, unfortunately, all the us fucking loser employees yeah, were locked in, in for six months, mm -hmm. and that was we IPO literally uh, right at the start of the dot com crash. I remember that day. I, re I remember I was working in the NIAN store. I remember being in the elevator because like, yeah. one of the like Morgan Stanley or one of these investment companies was, was in the same building. And yeah. I remember going to lunch that day when the dot bomb happened. And yeah, yeah. they did not look happy uh, downstairs. Yeah, very sad people. 